all the great fighters in the New York area, all over the country for that matter, fought at Sunnyside Garden. I was from the area, Queens. I'm a Corona boy. And we packed the place every time I fought, we sold out. And you had to win because you didn't want to go back to the neighborhood. You know what I'm saying to you? Sunnyside Gardens made me, made me what I, what I became. It was like the minor leagues for the garden. As you went in, on the left hand side, there was a bar. Yeah, I could remember that a lot of people being drunk and yelling, knock them out! <laughs> it wasn't the nicest place, Sunnyside Gardens, but it was our place. We loved that old rundown joint. Sunnyside Gardens, Golden Glove sub-novice heavyweights tangle in a series of hard slugging bouts under the auspices of the Daily News Welfare Association. In the first, Gene Bonina, Light Trump. In order to understand the culture of the fight clubs, you have to go back in time. Boxing was a huge sport. There were about in excess of two dozen arenas within a 10-mile radius of Times Square that operated on a weekly basis. And these were places for men to go for a night out. The common phrase was, night at the fights. Back then, boxing wasn't on television at all. If you wanted to see a boxing match, you had to go to see one live. And Sunnyside was the place to go. What a lot of people don't realize is that Sunnyside Garden wasn't built for boxing. It was built for tennis. Uh, there was a champion tennis player named Jay Gould, who was the grandson of a, of a major railroad magnet, who needed an indoor facility. So they built Sunnyside Garden for him, and it really didn't become a boxing venue until the 40s. Interestingly enough, Sunnyside Garden came along, I mean, just about at the same time that St. Nicholas Arena closed up. St. Nick's was the small club, I mean, without doubt. I mean, that was everything you could say about a small club was St. Nicholas Arena. And when that closed up, there was just uh, a need for a small club in, in the New York metropolitan area. And along comes Sunnyside Garden. I grew up about a block and a half from Sunnyside Garden. I was right down 44th Street. I was just always there. I mean, it was the biggest building in the uh, neighborhood. It was next to a Robert Hall clothing store where we all got our cheap suits for Easter. It was also a community center. They used to have, uh, primarily I think temples used to hold bazaars in there, we call them. And you buy cheap goods, you buy, uh, I guess like the equivalent of a garage sale today. I lived about four blocks away on 48th Street on Queen Boulevard. And they had a show there like every two or three weeks. I did go and they had like a headliner where Bobby Cassidy or Bobby O'Brien was fighting or even Vito Antifermo fought there. Boxing was the sport and it was a neighborhood sport. That's what made it different. And you went there to see the neighborhood fighters. So, so you're from Brooklyn, I'm from the Bronx. My neighborhood was tougher than your neighborhood and that was the bottom line. Nobody could beat our neighborhood. In your neighborhood, if you were a fighter, Oh my God, you were like idolized. People love fighting. And they'd put the posters in every barber shop and they'd give the barber two free tickets. What made it special for everybody was that you, you always followed the career of one guy. And it was such a small atmosphere that you got to talk to them. Regardless if they were winning or losing, they made you feel like you were standing in a world of giants and you were lucky to be there. Everybody felt like they're part of it. You didn't have to be a fighter, you know. You could have been a manager, a trainer, or even uh, just to watch the show. It was something magical about it. They recognized anybody that was a fighter. They would bring you up to the ring to honor each and every boxer that was in the audience. It was a family. Boxing is an ethnic sport. And at the club level, ethnic matchups are, are critical to selling tickets. And what city in the world could you get more ethnic matchups than New York City? If you were Irish, you went to see the Irish fighter you rooted for. If you were Jewish, you rooted for the Jewish fighter. And Irish people and Puerto Rican, they always had a big fight there. They fight to the end. This brought out the fans, and it, and it kept the, the turnstiles humming. It was a great arena because you had people, you felt like people were on top of you when you fought there. And when you got so many people yelling at you and screaming at you in that arena, it makes you more motivated. Find out what you really made out of you. Sunnyside Garden was a great, 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 great adventure to go through. If you want to make it in this sport, you had to go through Sunnyside because those guys were tough and rough. It created boxing fans. 
Because once you went to Sunnyside Glide, you were a boxing fan. They used to have wars there. And it was a great place to watch a fight because you just had the bleachers and you only had like 400 ringside seats. And it was, it was very, very cozy and very nice. Everybody knew everybody. Everybody go in the bleachers. You could see the fight from everywhere and you had a nice view. Sunnyside smelled like fights. It was like a mecca in the middle of Queens Boulevard, a one in a million kind of place. And what made Sunnyside good there was that you were right on the seven line. So no matter where you lived in the city, or, or in Queens or in Brooklyn, it was so accessible. So you always had great transportation. The crowd at Sunnyside, it was uh, a mixture of everybody. But one thing they had in common was boxing. And what I enjoyed about it was listening to the other fans talk about the fights because in those days, fight fans were knowledgeable. Most of them knew what they were watching. I promoted about four shows a year at Sunnyside Garden. It was a good neighborhood with good people, hardworking people. The crowd that came to Sunnyside was pretty much a blue collar crowd. They were not a quiet crowd, but you had a raucous crowd. It was dark and dingy, but it was kind of, it was quaint. And you sat there in the bleachers and you, you felt at home. You went there after a half a dozen times, you felt like you belong there. Not only were you late to drink out in the bleachers, but they had a bar and the bar was a little dark. And the preliminary fight is just to hang out at the bar too and have a beer or something, you know, because they trained for months ahead of time. I used to think, wow, great place to go in and have a beer because it had all the boxing pictures up. They would sit there and talk about the fight and a lot of them would have no future, but they would say, yeah, in two years I'm going to fight for the championship. Yeah, but you just got knocked out five minutes ago. You're not fighting for nothing. <laughs> well, a lot of guys used to hang out in the bar and they'd just come out when they fight, when that kid that they came to see was in a fight. So they'd come out and they'd be all juiced up and somebody say anything and they'd be throwing punches, you know, in the next minute. And they had to tie all the chairs down because uh, Nicky and Aggie, who owned the place, they got hit with a chair one night. One of my jobs at Sunnyside was selling beer. The first thing they taught me, my uncles, you don't give the cans. You pour the beer in the cup. A dollar for a big cup of beer and people spilling it on each other. Yeah, come on, the beer would be flying. And Well, I'm up there in the bleachers. I couldn't get the beer into the cups fast enough. I want to make money. That's the bottom line. So what I do is I just give them the cup with the can and I'm just giving it to them and I'm running back and I'm hustling. Well, the fight comes to a decision and uh, the Hispanic fella lost, and they littered. I, I, when I say littered, I mean there was so many beer cans in the ring getting thrown. I gotta say, after that, my uncle had chose someone else to sell beer at Sunnyside. I was uh, selling pretzels and hot dogs. If you went into the ring, there was a there was a cloud of smoke right over the ring because you had all the lights coming in. And no one ever took in consideration that the, the fighter's up there breathing and breathing and he's bringing in all that smoke and the cigar smoke and whatnot. We were used to that. We knew going to the door, look here, it's gonna be a smoke-filled atmosphere. You know, so you better skip your rope and just be in for a good fight. You know, if you're an asthmatic, you couldn't take it at Sunnyside. It would be condemned nowadays. They would never let you in it. They place was so full of smoke, you were glad to get to the dressing rooms, which were downstairs in the basement in the back. It wasn't much of a, of a shower room or a dressing room. It was, it was okay, I, I would say. I've seen a lot worse. The dressing room was always chaos there. Each fighter's it's got a manager, trainer, maybe he's may have two trainers. And then he's got like a bunch of friends. I remember, you, you know, you couldn't relax before fight, you, they tell you relax and, you know, how can you relax? all these people around, you know? They had the room for six rounders and four rounders, then they had the separate rooms from the main event. And I saw these guys, I was going, my God, I don't want to look like these guys. They had broken noses and everything, and, you know, their scar tissue. And uh, I was going, well, these guys are really in bad shape. And slowly, I, I, I got a lot of those rewards myself. You know? but, and it was ex exciting, but it was, it was at the time, it was very scary, because I never had any amateur fights, so I really was, this is all new to me. 
we fought for nothing. It, you had to love boxing in the day. We was only getting like uh, $75 for four rounds and $125 for six rounds. To go to a fight at Sunnyside Garden wasn't exactly going to Mayweather Pacquiao in terms of ticket prices. Uh, ringside was $4, uh, general admission was $2, and in essence, the promoter and the fighters were partners because if a fighter sold a certain amount of tickets, he'd get maybe $1.50 back for selling that ticket. It was only $4,000 to break even. That's what paying all the fighters and the rental and everything was $4,000. Even then, that the prices were so low, it was hard to make money. You really had to get a lot of people in there to make that four grand. I tell you, over there, it was family. You, you, everybody in my neighborhood was there. You know what I'm saying to you? It wasn't where they couldn't afford to come. They made it in the day reasonable. I had my best days there. I had nine fights. I won the whole nine. It was a riot one time. I jumped in the ring. My brother was fighting, and the referee pushed him. The guy's trainer pushed him, so I jumped in the ring. I shouldn't have, but two, with two twins, and you know, blood is thicker than water. I was a baker of my family, so all the bakers were there. When you got people there that are rooting for you, it made you fight hard. It's kill or be killed, and the way we were brought up. Well, it was my first fight ever, and I was fighting this guy, Bobby Noble. I didn't know anything about him. I really didn't care. I just wanted to turn pro, like, you know, start my career. It was very exciting, and my friends from the neighborhood came, and all of a sudden I was somebody important. And in fact, Newsday had a, a thing called Two Punch Debut in the paper. It was the first time I ever was in the paper. Sunnyside Garden was the preeminent club in New York City during the 70s. Uh, and so many really good New York City fighters got their start there. Sunnyside was saving the business in many ways. And just off the top of your head, all world-class fighters. You had guys like Oscar Bonavena who fought there on the undercard. You had uh, even my mile all the way from uh, Denver, Colorado. We also had uh, Tony Danza fight there three times. It gave the chance for some very good up-and-coming fighters to gain experience. This was a place that it was a staple of their life as young men. I think I fought twice over there. It's good for, for every, not only for, for every fighter like who's coming up, you know, it was uh, great over there to fight four rounds. Today you don't find any place like that. You know? Before you see every week was in uh, first form, Sunnyside Garden. There's a lot of places, but today you don't see it. Well, it was my first pro fight, so obviously you got a lot of stuff going on, but it was legendary. So many people fought from there that I knew of, and uh, it was magical, it was a magical night. Ronnie Harris was the main event that night, and, uh, and I got to fight the big uh, George Foreman lookalike. <laughs> it, it was a fast night. My first professional fight was at Sunnyside Garden in November of 71. A place that where you build fighters, and I, I remember my first year, I had about 12 fights. You know, that's where we, everything starts, you know. I used to sell tickets, and I used to bring all the people there. <laughs> I said, that was, that was great. Everybody root for me. I miss those kind of plays. What made Sunnyside Garden great is that it was a local arena that gave entertainment on every level. They even had roller derby and there, there was a female team. You used to watch Thursday Night Wrestling and they'd be advertising Sunnyside Garden for the big match. At that time, the uh, big professional wrestling, this is before Vince McMahon, but it was on Channel 5 in New York. Uh, so the guys at Sunnyside Garden were not the ones you saw on Channel 5. It was like a different tour of uh, wrestlers. I do remember sitting in the bleachers and Johnny Addy, who was this world famous boxing announcer, I guess he got paid 50 bucks or something to do the wrestling matches. And between each match, he would sit in the back row of the seated area and he would fix his watch. And the watch always went off 30 seconds before the match ended, it seemed. So he was, <laughs> I guess he knew what the script was. Let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill that we shall pay any price bear any burden, meet any hardship. You know, JFK was one of the most beloved guys. It was like the biggest thing in, in Sunnyside. Catholic president who was Irish coming to Sunnyside Gardens. In 1960, as part of the presidential campaign of John F. Kennedy, he held a rally 
in front of Sunnyside Gardens. Someone like uh, John Kennedy coming in, the first Irish, first Catholic to run for president, being Irish as well, and being in that bastion of Sunnyside, Woodside, and the whole atmosphere, having the L outside, and also they had strong democratic organizations in those areas. So it, it would definitely generate that type of popular support, even if people who may not have fully agree with Kennedy on his positions, they would have that, again, tribal identification. So that was a great location. But boxing was the key thing for Sunnyside Guns. The Sunnyside Guns have always been known for boxing. One of the more creative matchups in the history of Sunnyside Garden, the Civil Servants Championship of New York City. John Clohesse, a sanitation worker, Tony Gagliardi, a New York City detective, Gene Moore, the matchmaker, put them together. Tremendously creative matchup. It was like a miniature Ali Frazier thing, almost. Like you know, it was it was that crazy. You know, I mean, it was it was um it was important. They were sold out at six o'clock at night. You couldn't get in. Seventeen hundred and one people there. That was the official count. Capacity was fifteen hundred, so they squeezed two hundred and one in there. Clohesse, who I saw come up from the amateurs, he was a Golden Glove champ. He was exciting. Plus, he was good looking. He was blonde. And he also brought in the women, along with the male fans. And Gagliardo was making like this comeback. He fought in the 50s. Tough cop from Long Island. Short, squat, was a classic club fighter. But he was colorful. He, he took a good punch. He came into the, to the arena with a mink coat on. It was like a, it was the atmosphere of a, like a, a wrestling event. He had a huge entourage of cops. He was like an alley. He would go out there. He was a good promoter. You know, he would call me names. You know, he tried to inflame the, the situation, you know. But we had Gene Moore on our side, and he was just as bad. Sanitation guys had garbage cans covers, and they were banging the garbage can covers. Bang, bang, bang. Boom, boom. <laughs> Killed the pigs they were yelling and everything else. It was terrific. He was easy to hit with the jab, so I hit him with a lot of jabs. and. Uh, and they cut both his eyes. And ordinarily, any other time, they probably would have stopped the fight. But because it was like the Army-Navy game with the sanitation against the police, it was crazy. So they weren't going to do that. Tony was old then. And John was just had one of the Golden Gloves with six straight knockouts. So Tony was, Tony was a big, uh, tough, tough guy, but a little too old for John. So John won the decision. Of course, the cops felt embarrassed. How could they lose, you know, a sanitation, man? Oh, my God. It was um, quite an achievement. I felt really good. It was my duty to do my best, and, um, and I did. I remember one of the last fights I attended at Sunnyside Gardens was Harold Johnson versus Herschel Jacobs. And what made that fight interesting was that Harold Johnson was making a comeback at the age of 44. Marvin Goldberg, he came to me proposing that we take Harold Johnson. He's making his comeback fight, and he would like to fight a good fighter, and he thought of Herschel Jacobs. We made the match right off the bat. This was a big story, a 44-year-old ex-champion having to fight because his finances, you know, impelled him to go back into the ring. It was made for a TV story. There was a guy who was a manager, and he asked me, did I know who Harold Johnson was? And I didn't know, you know, I mean, it was before my time. So I felt a little, like, awkward because everybody knew who Howard Johnson was. He was beautiful to watch. He was a throwback fighter. And I had never seen Harold Johnson in person. I had seen him on television. So this was the opportunity to see Harold Johnson fight in person. And he took his robe off, and he looked like Hercules. I mean, he, he was so put together, you know, was, uh, I was amazed. Maybe the greatest fighter ever to fight at Sunnyside Garden. Johnson got stopped on cuts, and it turned out to be the last fight of his career. It just didn't draw in the number of fans that you would think it would. For me, it meant a lot because I finally got to see Harold Johnson do his moves, and even though it was only three rounds, I, I never forgot it. There was nobody tougher than Bobby Cassidy. He had at least 25 fights there. I believe that he kept Sunnyside Gardens alive because of all the fights that he did have there and the crowd of people he brought. Sunnyside Gardens made me, made me what I, what I became. But since I didn't have, you know, illustrious amateur career, I had to learn how to fight. And that's where I learned how to fight. 
Duke Stefano was the assistant matchmaker for Madison Square Garden. He used to book the fights for like Sunnyside. <clears throat> and after a certain win, he would come back and tell my trainer, you're going to the garden, you earned it. Like, you know, so it really was like a, a training grounds for, to fight in the garden and make bigger money. My first honeymoon, I saw the Rockettes. And I, I watched them, whatever. And I said uh, to my wife at the time, I says, well, you know, I have to go to Sunnyside Gardens. She goes, what? I said, yeah, I have to go because I'm a professional athlete. I have to pay my respects there. Like, I have to go there. You know? And she went with me and we watched fights. Yeah, it was pretty cool. I held the record for the most main events there, which, which I'm blessed to have. And I like that, but uh, it's uh, something I'll never forget. Shows that I was in with a lot of tough guys because you don't fight easy guys in Sunnyside Gardens. You fight tough guys. Do you miss it? Yeah, I miss every day of it. I love it. Love it to this day. Nineteen seventy-two, I fought eleven times. Eleven times in one year. That's unheard of. <laughs> Today, you know, there's not enough venues in New York State or New York City to keep boxing on a regular basis. Missing out on those kind of small shows has hurt the business in a lot of ways because of the fact that the fighters can't get that constant experience. There's hardly any boxing in New York to speak of. Sunnyside was the last club. It was the last of a dying breed. What ultimately happened to Sunnyside Garden in the late 70s is what had happened to most of the major clubs in New York City. In the 50s, there was a lot of boxing on free television for the first time. And a lot of the fans who were regularly going to club shows stopped going to club shows because they were getting their product on TV for free. Just about every neighborhood in New York was changing. A lot of people that were coming in were people from outside the country. They were looking to work 16 hours a day and not to spend their money on boxing. You could actually see the change in boxing and society in a way by the fight posters. Because in the 40s, you would see Irish fighters' names. You would see Jewish fighters' names. Suddenly, you no longer saw uh, an O'Leary or a Riley on a fight poster. Now you began to see Hispanic names, and you began to see more African-American names. The, the fighters of the Jewish and Irish background were no longer on the bottom rung of society. Okay, so they had moved out and away from boxing. And now who was taking their place? The new poor. My Uncle Nick and my Uncle George took over Sunnyside Gardens. And they introduced my dad, and he's sitting next to me. Now my dad can't hear them calling his name because he's deaf. And I signed to my father, they're calling you. I hear them calling your name. Get up into the ring. And my father was so thrilled. I wish I had a camera. This is 1975 and I don't have a cell phone. So there's no pictures of that, but I have it in my head of my father being with his two brothers in the ring. My uncles, unfortunately, were the last ones to close the doors on Sunnyside, and I miss it. The last fight was Ramon Ranqueo, a light heavyweight from Mexico, fought some fighter from Mississippi in 1977. Uh, I still remember for me, yeah, Sunnyside Garden, beautiful place. Everybody wants to fight there. Everybody likes to fight. You fight there, and you going up good. You just told me, yeah, what's the last fight? I, I don't even know. <laughs> but it's uh, nice to be the last one. Huh? And that was it. They closed the doors. And that's a very sad time, uh, not just for boxing, but for New York City boxing, because the clubs were the, the, the blood flow of boxing in New York City. Sunnyside Garden was an important piece of New York City history, and it should never be forgotten. Uh, here we are. The old Sunnyside Gardens is now a Wendy's. Uh, I was like Sunnyside Gardens owned there for a while, you know? And uh, people loved me. You know? People liked me a lot, yeah. It was fun. How many times have you made the drive into Sunnyside Garden in your life? If you had to guess, how many times do you think it's been? Oh, I don't know. 50, 60, 70 times? What goes through your mind when you drive through the old neighborhood? Uh, I look at the Chinese restaurant that was still there for so many years. I look at the bar that was across the street, it's another bar, but it's still there. And uh, yeah, it just brings back memories. And I think it's uh, 
it's great that we have a monument stipulating what great fighters we are. Moment of silence, please. Silence, guys. And I'd like to say in 1977, Sunnyside Garden went to heaven. And the way this place closed, it never had a, a, a real send-off. Closed up quickly without, without much ado. The last show here, two guys fought. They weren't even New Yorkers in front of a crowd of about 400 people. And so today, we give this plot of earth, this red brick building that used to stand here, and the men that shed their blood in this shack, we give them the respects. Fought 25 times on these grounds. And that is Bobby Cassidy, the Shamrock Kid.